All right, well, uh, joining us now is Sherlock Holmes fan and creator of the equally legendary goons, comedian Michael Bainty. He also has rearranged the furniture. I don't know if you've got a wide shot. Yes. yes. We seem well, to be yeah. missing... A... Well, look, I mean, nowadays they expect you to sit on this. Look, so you go down there and you go... <laughs> and you finish with your knees. Yeah. So what I've done is I've taken two cushions and so I can sit. The props it's guys are going tight, bananas. And it's comfortable. It's and comfortable. even then, look how far you sink down. Look, keep even going, then, yes. Keep going, keep going, keep going. We're, going. we're still looking up to you. We still are. You are, you are a fan of, uh, of Sherlock Holmes. I love Sherlock fans. Holmes. It's a wonderful thing. What I do now is when I'm walking down Baker Street, I've, I've got one of those faces that people stop. They also stop buses, but you know, <laughs> people walking along and they see me, they think, oh, I'll stop him. He's got a kindly look. And a lot of Japanese people looking lost with cameras. They go, oh, 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 oh. And one of them will come up and say, excuse me, I say, you're looking for two, 221B Baker Street, aren't you? How do you know this? I said, a lot of people ask me this. I'm an expert on Baker Street. I said, where is it? I said, behind you. Because it doesn't matter where you are in Baker Street, because yeah. it's never existed anyway. So you can say it's anyway. He said, yeah. well, it's says Tesco. I said, ah, yes, but you see, during the war, we had a lot of air raids, and 221B was destroyed, and they built Tesco. Oh, you take pictures? Certainly, delighted. So they all stand there, and take a picture, boom, you see, and they go back to Japan, and they're taking the picture, and they go, oh, tell you, tell me, tell you, 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 And his friend, who, who met me the year before, says, no, no, 221B Sainsbury's, you see. And, and I have a wonderful time, and with luck, they might hit each other. It's my revenge for the last this is war. your revenge for yes, the war, yes, absolutely. Yeah. You, were, you were actually in intelligence in the war, weren't you? Yes, it shows you how desperate the yes. British were from yes. 1943 onwards. <laughs> it was interesting. They said, what languages do you speak? I said, well, fluent French and Spanish. They said, marvellous, and put me with the Poles. <laughs> I mean, that is typical. It is, yes. Oh, and they were lovely. The I love it. They taught me how to... F you fight a war 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year until it's over and you've won, when we then betrayed them. Yes. Mm. We totally betrayed my Poles. They were wonderful. They could not only read the bottom line of the eye chart, they could actually pronounce it. <laughs> they were the most marvellous people I've ever known. Oh, great. I loved them. Loved them. Just Ma loved my Poles. Michael, you've, you've, written, um, you've written three books now. About no, I've written 13, actually. The, well, about yes. the paranormal. Oh, three books about, well, they're all a bit about the paranormal, really, when you think about it, because that's been my life. Mm. You know, nobody could say a normal life, could they, really? <laughs> As I always say, you know, I, I say to people, what I do is ridiculous. The fact that I get paid for it is paranormal, <laughs> when you think about it, which it is. Yes. But you see, people accept the paranormal without even realizing. I mean, I work with a lot of natural people, like Peruvian rainforest Indians and uh, uh, Aborigines in Australia and Bedouin in the Middle East. I've worked with them all, all up and down African coast. Uh, right the way around from Morocco, right down mm. Middle East and then down into East Africa and the Horn of Africa and right down into South Africa. And uh, studying what these amazing people can do. They can communicate with each other. And I, I asked one chap, why you actually do it? I said, you know, you just concentrate and your friend can, can hear or your family can hear what you're mm. thinking about. He said, well, because we're very poor, if we were rich, we'd use the telephone. <laughs> and that sounded like good common sense. The thing is, you see, I, th I suspect that for someone like you, with, with your psyche, it's, it's, it's easier to take all these things as read. For example, I, I mentioned the fact that you were in intelligence in the war, because you actually used to look at some of the air crew, you were of the RAF, at some of yes. the air crew who were about yes. to go off on a mission, and you would yes. know, just by looking at them, yes. which ones were going to die. Well, uh, that's because of the rapport. You see, I was failed air crew myself. My eyes had been screwed up by an injection which had killed one of us. And, and paralyzed another and actually killed me and they brought me back you know mm -hmm. in those days you didn't have the paddles and all that luck they just massaged you back banged your chest up and down till I came back mm -hmm. and so I'd been through the death process now whether that is just an illusion of the the mind as it as it goes through the the shock of uh, of leaving the body or whatever the death process is because no scientist can tell you mm. they can only say yes well of course it's fibrillation and it's retinal shunting and the ganglia around the star and you say splendid what's the moment of death well I, we don't know <laughs> it's that sort of thinking yeah. that's why they have people on these support systems for a hell of a long time and eventually they they shut it all down and they've been long dead really they just yes. kept alive by all the uh, the mechanism yes. but uh, having gone through the that particular process and finding out there was nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. You were awestruck. God, that, oh, that's what it's all about, was the feeling. Mm -hmm. And then we were pulled back. You know, well, what, do, what do you remember of it then? I remember the light, enormous amount of light, which wasn't blinding, but it was just light. You were surrounded by light. I thought, ah, oh, oh, this is the greatest thing ever, because mm -hmm. the pain had stopped. I was in bloody agony. They'd given us ATT TAB, which was anti tetanus, anti typhoid, anti paratyphoid, and anti typhus, except they'd given us the cultures 
and not the serum. And not the serum. Hadn't been treated. Oh, so they gave us those four diseases in one whack. As I say, it killed one chap, paralyzed another, and put me on my back for six, six months altogether, yes. and blinded me. It was, it was a murderous experience doing it. But once the pain was over, because you were arched like a bow with a tetanus, once the, the pain was over, and you were out of the body, they said, oh, yeah. oh yeah. you're a great feeling. Michael, well, we, we're not leaving you because you're coming back. We have to go to uh, the other I am not being left. But you are not well, being left. You are indeed coming so back to talk to us. A little bit more. Surrounded by light. He'll be back after the break. We're we'll going be to finding out, I hope, shortly, from uh, the man who helped create some of the most enduring TV and radio after shows of the 50s and the 60s. But first, uh, we're bringing you bang up to date on this morning. Here it is. Coming up in just a couple of seconds, the godfather of the goons, Michael Benting, giving us a lowdown on the high spots of his memorable career. And although we may hate Mondays, patron saint of pop music, Bob Geldof, has made a date with us on today's This Morning. He'll be around at about ten past eleven. And uh, if you're slack at belting up, we'll be clamping down on safety and car-wise at ten to twelve. Now, the, the death of a child is the most painful loss of all. Our phone-in today deals with the anguish that families face when they lose a son or a daughter. But later on, we'll be talking to parents who have learned to cope with their grief. So uh, if your family is suffering and you'd like some advice, then please call us now on 051 555 1000. Here's the line-up for the rest of Monday on This Morning. First, we're going back to Michael, Michael Benteen, and we, we've just been talking, we are going to be talking later on in the programme about losing a child. What you were saying before the news, which is that you knew by looking at certain RAF men who, who were going to die, you, you knew who was actually not going to come back from a mission. You had a very similar experience looking at your own son. Yes. Could, yes. What well, simply, um, having been brought up with this sort of thing since I was a little boy of about eight, I was one of my father's guinea pigs, my father was a scientist who was investigating the paranormal, then called the supernormal, with a whole team of scientists. And so I was brought up with it. So when we had furniture moving around on its own in our house, it seemed quite normal. And when I used to go to other little boys' houses and nothing moved around the place, I used to think how deprived they were. <laughs> you say, oh, poor devils, you know, now the furniture moves on its own and things. So one was brought up with that sort of atmosphere. It's a slightly different attitude to life and death. Um, it's an ongoing thing. It doesn't mean that the shock of losing somebody that you love is, uh, is any easier to bear. Of course it isn't. Because the best advice I can give, having lost three adult children whom I love very dearly, is, um, and I've got two others, thank God, uh, is purely that if you follow what an animal does, you howl like a dog and get all the emotion out of you, you're really suffering from shock more than anything. And then you get the guilt, my God, if I'd have been there, would it have been different? Could I, could I have saved? And all this sort of rubbish, rubbish goes on. And in actual fact, most of it is just trying to get rid of the shock, to sublimate it. And you mustn't adopt a negative attitude with an awful lot of people come around and say, what a terrible thing, what a ghastly experience. And the media didn't, uh, didn't help, because being sort of vaguely in the public eye, because I've been long enough around to sure. be a piece of biodegradable furniture now. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, we didn't have a lot of peace. and We had no mercy at all. They were really probing and probing and probing. Until because I told this guy, I'd actually... literally get a shotgun and go and blow him in half, which I felt like doing at the time. But that was a good, healthy reaction to it. You've got to be positive. There are so many people need help in mm. this life. If you concentrate on somebody who's left this life, you're being negative. Mm. So obviously, every time I think of my children, it's a trick of the mind, really. I smile. Yes. I mean, consciously, because... I, I thank God for every minute I had on this earth with my children and every second I enjoy with this communication with them. Now, yes. whether the communication is self-delusion or not doesn't matter a damn. It's the attitude of mind of the parent who's lost the child or the husband who's lost the wife or vice versa. And you've actually said, like, like I ought to say that your son Mark was killed in a plane crash. Um, and you've actually said that... Uh, son Gus, actually. I'm so yes, sorry. Right. I do no, beg your no, pardon. No. I do beg your I pardon. probably had another son called Mark, but I don't think he was killed in a... <laughs> no, I, I do, be, I do beg your pardon. Who knows? But anyway, he, you actually heard him speaking to you. Oh, um, yes, very much so. Died. Well, it's a question of heard. How do you hear? You hear the way an artist hears. When I write dialogue, I hear it. When I, uh, I see all these unusual pieces of comedy, which people say that I'm supposed to write the most original comedy that there is, it's all visual comedy mm. and what have you. And I've said, yes, because it's no talent. I see it before it's actually happened. It's a probability factor coming up, and I see it. Any child could be trained to do the same thing. Any child with any sort of imagination. I was trained to do it. So what did you actually see when you looked at these aircrew and when you looked at your son and you saw that they were, that they were going death's to die? A death's head. A death's head. Well, I saw them as, as though they were dead. 
all of a sudden he was talking to them and he changed to the death said it's not to be recommended i went to the chaplain and i said look um, i can't take this it's been going on about a month and uh, he wasn't at all surprised so i said you don't seem surprised he said no a lot of people come with this anybody who's very close to air crew or members of air crew pick up the rapport of total total feeling of being one with the air crew of course he was because i was failed a failed air crew myself and flew with them a lot and so therefore i had this bridge this link with them and he said lots of other people do the waf did the parachute packers did they knew when they were going to go they had an awful lot of waf very sensitive girls extremely nice girls and there was this this feeling what the hell could i do about it i couldn't tell them i just briefed them to go out on the operation but you told your son didn't you I told my son because that wasn't a necessary operation. And what did I he said, say? if you fly with this young pilot, it was a very nice lad. And they used to go scuba diving every week. And I'm terrified of scuba diving. I'm not terrified of flying, because obviously I'm a pilot, you know. And um, uh, he said, what have you got against him as a pilot? I said, he can be reached off. And if you are together in an aeroplane, I have seen that you will both be killed. And of course, you know, being a son, they don't really listen to their dads, even, because it happened. Even though he'd been brought up with you, as you were brought up with your own father, yes. taking for granted that extraordinary things do happen. Yes. But he still didn't believe you. No, it wasn't that. It was purely that circumstance found them together. Mm. And I suppose it was the, probably the last thought he had on, on this earth was, my God, the old man was right, you know. Yes. Not, much of a, uh, not much of a consolation. Mm. But the only advice I can give is think positively about your children. Mm. Force yourself to remember them when they were kids, no matter how painful it is at first. And then slowly you'll, you'll think, oh, blimey, that's the day we went down and we did this. All think of all the positive things. Yeah. Do you still, I mean, to me it sounds horrific, to be honest with you. I, I would it is horrific. Like, it is horrific, like make no mistake. That. Right, I mean, does this still happen to you? I mean, in everyday life, do, can you look at people and sense something's going to happen to them? Um, not, I hope, as negative as that. I very often see success. I mean, I saw it with a very big star, uh, Michael Crawford, who came to see me about something quite different uh, because he was, you know, a bit, uh, a bit down. He wanted to chat up, but the, we didn't even know each other terribly well. But he'd seen me on telly the night before, and he said, I want to have a chat with him. And he, f I don't know, he just got to one of those stages in the career where you feel that it's all over and what. I can't think why, because he's so talented. Mm -hmm. And I was just about to say, but you'll do terribly well. And as clearly as anything, I heard, there's a show in the pipeline for him. It's going to be the biggest success he's ever dreamt of. So I said, look, uh, you probably think I'm nuts anyway, but this is what I have just picked up. And I told him. And he said, well, that's lovely, but I can't think of one. And I said, well, I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know anything, but I'm just saying what I was told. And... Uh, uh, he said, well, do you know a good medium? I said, yes, I know several very good mediums. So I put him on to one, Betty Shine. And uh, Betty said, oh, yes, she said, I, I've just picked up. You're going to do a show that's in the pipeline. It's going to be the biggest success you've ever had. And of course, he did Phantom. But, it's you know, the these opera. things, so many of them are positive ideas. Yeah. But people pick it up the whole time. They ignore it. Well, I, I should have played the hunch, they say. Yeah. What is a hunch? You see, we... we, we tend to live by the rules with which we're surrounded. But I've worked with a lot of the natural people of the earth, like, the, as I say, all up and down Africa and the rainforest Indian, the Aborigine, and they go by instinct. And my father's advice, which I, which yes. I encapsulated in that book, was very simple. Open your mind, listen to your intuition, filter it through your rationale, and you won't go far wrong. And the old man summed it up by saying, Keep your mind and your bowels open and you won't go far wrong. <laughs> See, get rid of all the poison in you. Good Mike, thinking. Thank you very much for talking to us. I've yeah, got a hunch now. I've got a hunch that we've uh, got to go on to open.